Okay, everybody, we're live here today. Let's take a look at these uh, one closures, state of the markets. We had quite an exciting year last year, and I got to tell you, we've got a very exciting year scheduled for you this year too. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's it's exciting. Um, right out of the gate, we've got the coronavirus, right? How exciting is that? I mean, if you catch the virus, do they give you a lime? Well, I don't know. That's a joke, right? Corona virus. All right. Start the start the year off with a joke. Real quick, if you would, um, my mother always has uh, somehow she has an uncanny ability. To always call me like right in the middle of a presentation or right when I'm giving blood or one of these things. So if you would, just put your phone on vibrate. So if my mom calls you, uh, it won't disturb your neighbor. It's amazing. It really is. It's uncanny. So. Here we go, our favorite chart. We uh, had a great year last year. Even our 50-50 models did 14, 15%. That's amazing. Um, but you can see all the way back in 2010, the Dow was at 10,000, and now we're pushing 28, 29,000. Probably might hit 30,000 before this thing is over, right? But we, we've all been through this before in history, and notice that this starts at 2010. So that doesn't all the way go back to 2008. But we remember what happened in 2008. Now, the benefit that all of you here have is that all of you have a little bit of gray hair, like I do. And that means you remember things that happened in the past. These people that are coming up now, the new millennials, the new generation, they don't remember 2008 the way you and I remember it, right? They remember 2008 the way maybe you maybe remember 1963 or something, you know? You were probably partying then. You weren't thinking about the markets. But guess what? In 2008, you were thinking about the markets and probably all the way back to 2000 or 1987. So we've seen this before. Um, one of the things that drives the market, the key thing that drives the market is what? Earnings, corporate earnings. These corporations do their thing and they have earnings. And you can see the red line here has been corporate earnings. And corporate earnings have continually grown and grown and grown. The thing about, I think, America today is we don't necessarily look at things from one year to the next or one decade to the next. We just look at things really from quarter to quarter. You know, and I think that's a real negative because basically what's happening at all of these corporations is the CEOs, the CFOs, and all the C-suite people are doing what they can to push up the share price, and that might not be the best thing to push it up artificially through stock buybacks and other things. But remember, these guys are getting options, and a lot of their bonuses are tied to stock performance. So for them, that's what we're going to do. You can always be assured that corporations will always do what's in the best interest of their leadership. Be assured of that. Not necessarily what's in the best interest of the shareholders long term, but what's in their best interest. And usually that's a stock option thing and a bonus kind of thing. That's how corporate America works today. Uh, my grandfather worked for Standard Oil of New Jersey, became uh, Amico, then became BP. You know, he worked basically at one job his entire life, retired at 65. They gave him a rocking chair, a very nice rocking chair. And, uh, and he died two or three years later, right on schedule, right? And that's the way that worked back then. Um, and he had a pension. And so as long as everybody was dying before 70 or before 75, those pension plans were solvent, right? My grandmother, on the other hand, worked for Sears. Sears. Anybody heard of Sears? Okay. All right. Anybody still shop at Sears? Who still shops at Sears? Amazing. Amazing. But everybody shopped at Sears one, one time or another, I guarantee you. Uh, and so Sears, she was in the catalog department down in Ponce de Leon. And Grandma lived to almost 102. She was getting a pension the whole time. Now, you ask yourself, why is Sears no longer around? Well, because of Grandma. Right? <laughs> she was getting that pension. But in corporate America, it's all about earnings. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. But here you can see corporate earnings have hit... 2019, they hit all-time highs. Now, stop right here for a second, and I want you to take a mental note and maybe even dash down how many times I say all-time high today. Think about that. How many times am I going to say all-time high? It's coming up. 
But earnings per share, all-time high. Stock market, all-time high. Earnings, profitability, all-time high. Corporate bonuses, all-time high. Stock buybacks, all-time high. We've seen this before. We've been at a situation where it was an all-time high. You know, and we're just going to talk about something that we see here. Advancing earnings. Now, this is interesting because corporate America is not satisfied. They're never satisfied with stable earnings. They're never satisfied with stable sales. They always want what? More, more, more. more. Growth, growth, growth. So they're not okay with our sales are, are fine. No, no, no. They want sales growth. They want increasing growth, always increasing growth. So when growth changes to negative, generally the market will drop. When growth is positive, the market will generally do well. So recently we have seen now where we, again, the stock market is at an all-time high. Growth, corporate growth is at an all-time high. But you can see, if you can see these gray lines here at the very end, you can see that's starting to drop off a little bit. And you know, it takes three months for us to get the information. Uh, so the quarter ends and at the end of March, and it takes you know, us till like June, July before we really can get all those numbers and crunch all the numbers and figure out. And then always, there's always uh, you know, a correction a few weeks later or a few months later. But advanced earnings drives the market. Global economy never better. U.S. manufacturing, highest level ever. Industrial production, highest level ever. Now, you know things, and we're all old enough to know that things go in cycles, right? That's just the way things are. They go in through cycles. And when we're at the highest level ever, you have to wonder, are we going to go higher? Is it possible to go higher infinitely? Or perhaps may we be looking at another cycle? The unemployment rate, you could say in the reversed highest level ever of employment, because we are now at what they would say, I guess, our lowest unemployment level in, in decades, maybe ever. But you know, we get this information from the Department of Bureau of Labor Statistics. So my question is here, how many people fully trust the Bureau of Labor Statistics? <laughs> Raise your hands. Not one person? Come on, come on. Not one person fully trusts the Bureau of Labor Statistics? No? Oh, okay. Well, you're good not to because uh, they changed this formula a couple of times. Like we changed the inflation formula, changed it in 1980, changed it again in 1990. We changed those formulas when we don't like what they say. You know, we didn't like that. Uh, so, you know, people have argued, well, does this unemployment rate uh, include the people who are part-time? Or maybe they have two part-time jobs. Or maybe they have a job that they used to be full-time, but they're no longer full-time. Maybe they're just doing consulting, and maybe they're only getting 30 hours. There's all kinds of different ways to, to, to do these statistics. And I think most of us realize that when we see these government numbers, eh, we have to kind of take them with a little bit of uh, skeptability. Ability a word. I just I just invented that. Okay. I'm going to go with skepticism, skeptability, but I, I kind of like that, right? It's like eurosclerosis. Things just kind of work together. So the question is that we have, and I kind of jumped through all that, but can this continue? Is that what you're thinking? Can this continue? I mean, we all want it to. There's no question about that. There's no question about that, right? But do you know what a stamp cost in 1965 to mail a letter? Who said that? A nickel? Who said that? Nickel. Very good. A nickel. It cost five cents to mail a letter in 19... I have proof because I have canceled uh, envelopes up there. Five cents. What does it cost today? 50. Okay, I think it's 50 is the last time I... 55. 55. So last week we went up another nickel. All right, so we went from five cents to 55 cents. Now, you could see how if we could equate that to the stock market... The stock market was 10,000, and now let's just say 30,000. If we had uh, a, a, to mail a letter, it was, used to be 5 cents, now it's 55 cents. Has the act of mailing a letter really changed? 
No, it's not. What has changed is the value of our currency, the value of our money. Because we used to be able to get a lot more for our money than what we get today. And the reason for that is why? Inflation. But what causes inflation? <laughs> we always get a singular answer for everything, the government. But no, inflation is caused by an increase in the money supply, and money, the money supply is, uh, is basically mandated and controlled by the Federal Reserve. So what the Federal Reserve does is they do what we call stimulus. Anybody ever heard of stimulus? Anybody heard of quantitative easing? Anybody ever heard of buying bonds, buying treasuries? Anybody ever heard of expanding the balance sheet? All those things are the same. They all mean the same thing. You know what they mean? Printing money. Who said that? Very good. They just mean printing money. That's what they mean. And by printing money, they basically steal the money out of our pockets, steal the money out of our accounts. We didn't get to print the money. We had to work for it. I'm pointing to you because I know you're still working. But, yeah. <laughs> but everybody else in here, everybody, you know, we had to work for it. We have to invest it. We have to take a risk to pay taxes on it, all these other things. It's just not fair that they just get to print it. And you know what? If they were... If they were just kind of okay with it, like kind of behind the scenes, doing a little bit now and again, you wouldn't really care so much. But we went from an $800 billion base to over $4 trillion within a matter of just a few years. Yeah. So it really concerns me. It's inflation, and it really concerns me. But now let's talk about some things that have popped up. If you go to our website, MagellanPlanning.com, and you go over to the Learning Center, and you see client newsletters, you can go all the way back to 2008, I think, when I started writing these newsletters, or at least we were able to post them. And you can go back to see where I was very, very, very bullish back then. I even wrote an article called A Rocket Full of Rocket Fuel, right? And it was. We tripled our, tripled our money since I read that, wrote that article. But now I am looking at other factors. You know, there are other factors, and I'm just factual. I have no... Emotional involvement, I'm just factual. Leading indicators, you know, I was talking about unemployment, things like that. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. That's one of the last things to change. So when you go on the news and you're talking, and people are saying, you gotta get in, you gotta buy, you gotta buy, you gotta buy. They're talking about all these wonderful things. A lot of those things they're talking about are lagging indicators. Lagging means those are the things that come last. What we want to look for are leading indicators, something that's going to tell us something about what's going to happen ahead of time. Do you agree? Yeah. What is a lagging? I mean, I know when, once the, I mean, I know if it's raining. I know I'm standing outside. It's raining. I want to know that morning is it going to rain, right? Do you do you agree? So leading indicators we want to look at. The trade wars we've had, you know, that that's been going on for a while. We're going to talk about that. Triple B bond refinancing. Anybody been reading my letters? Some, a few, okay. One, two, all right. <laughs> that makes me feel good, appreciate that. Uh, inverted yield curve, we'll talk about that. Negative rates, credible. Schiller PE ratio, a little more technical. The Buffett indicator. And then lastly, the repo rate spike, which really was the wake-up call for us all. Anybody hear about the repo rate spike? What does that even mean? It's not repo like they're going to repossess your car. It means repo like in re repurchase agreement. But we'll talk about each of these. First off, let's look at some of the leading indicators. And again, we're always going to be about three months behind in our information. We're always about three months behind because it takes forever to get these charts out. But if you look at, again, second quarter earnings even, all right. Uh, for S&P 500, you can see that, you know, uh, communication, healthcare, financials, real estate, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, utilities, even all of those positive earnings growth. But we're now starting to see some sectors of negative earnings growth, energy, industrials and materials, industrials and materials. Now, that's interesting because a lot of the things that we look at as a leading indicator are industrial orders, orders that corporations are submitting to manufacturers. And manufacturers have had six back-to-back -back drops, per six months of back-to-back -back decreasing orders. So that is definitely a bearish 
leading indicator. Manufacturing and services. Again, you can see here that those have now turned into sort of negative territory, right? This all trickles down. Again, these are leading indicators. Manufacturing a good barometer for future corporate earnings growth. Now, remember I said these companies don't have to start losing money. They just have to stop growing as much as they were growing. That becomes negative in, the, in our quarterly, from quarter to quarter corporate world. Does everybody see what I'm talking about there? Make sense? So let's talk about trade. Now we've all been, you know, I don't know if you watch CNN or Fox. I have to watch them both just to figure out who's talking to me because if you, it's just amazing the dichotomy that you get between those two. And then the BBC, you throw that in there and it's all, it's all crazy. But events on trade, it's been sort of a rough ride. Uh, in February, uh, Trump said he was not going to raise the tariffs on China. He was going to postpone that. That was, I think, because of some, um, they, they were having some sort of national holiday or something. Uh, in May 5th, President Trump uh, threatens tariffs on additional $300 billion. And you see how the market goes, right? You see how when there's a negative headline, market drops. And then there's a positive headline, and the market's back up. And, you know, we, we, just, we just signed another trade deal, and then we're on to the next one. But no one even has a chance to read these things. Um, so then finally, on August 5th, U.S. labeled China, China a currency manipulator. Well, surprise, they've been doing that since the 80s. And we just had it would wait to August 5th, 2019 to finally call them for what they are. Back in the 80s, we didn't care because China was just a nobody, right? But now it's the second largest economy in the entire world. And they probably will. Have anybody ever been to China? If you've been to China, is that just not a massive beast, right? It's incredible. And once all those guys get working and they start getting efficient, it's going to be incredible. And I always said this, China did not take over Hong Kong. Hong Kong took over China. And once those communists got a taste of that capitalism and all the stuff that they can do with it, it has morphed into sort of a capitalistic, communistic, totalitarian regime. Uh, and behind the scenes, there's a lot of capitalism going on, right? But they can come through and just quarantine a whole city of 11 million people, and nobody's going to say a thing, you know, because they'll disappear, right? And then finally, the most beautiful deal in the history of trade deals. <laughs> the U.S. announced the phase one trade deal. No one really knows what's in it there, but it's, it's beautiful. Um, and, you know, we'll see how this goes. But I can tell you, you know, China is a communist country. They have a one-party leadership. The whole uh, modus operandi of that country is to stay in power. And part of what they're doing is they are in bed with pretty much every commercial enterprise in the country. And I just don't see them changing that. I really don't. So, you know, we have these great ideas and some headlines and stuff. But at the end of the day, I think China is just going to be China, you know. And maybe some of these things stick, but I think over time they're probably going to fall away, especially when the next administration comes in. Um, and so... Now we're doing the European imports. We're starting to, t to tariff the imports uh, on Europe. And then some, finally, the uh, steel and aluminum uh, from Brazil and Argentina. Anybody hear about that? Now, what do we call that thing that we put Coke can, that we make Coke cans out of in Australia? Aluminium. Aluminium, right? <laughs> okay. It is spelled differently. I did check on that. So you guys aren't crazy. It really is spelled differently. You probably are crazy, but not for that purpose. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so, triple B bond refinancing. This is something that, you know, is not exciting to talk about, but let's, let's talk about it. First off, let's uh, figure out what does that mean even? You know, okay, so a company like, let's just say Ford, everybody's heard of Ford. Ford has a bunch of stock out there, and they want to buy back their stock. So, they basically take cash that they borrow from you and other investors through bonds that they issue. So a bond is basically an IOU. You're going to buy that bond, and then you're going to give me your money. I'm going to take that money. I'm going to buy back my stock out there, 
and fewer shares out in the marketplace means that each individual share is worth more. It's like reverse inflation, right? That's a good thing. But every bond out there has a grade, if you will. And if you're above triple B, you're what's called investment grade. If you're below triple B, obviously, you're what's called non-investment grade, also known as high yield, also known as junk, junk right? So what has happened is said, and this is text, okay, but this is a guy from MarketWatch, I think, who basically said that the U.S. has been troubled, tr excuse, flooded, which will be troubled, with these triple B rated bonds. In the past 10 years, the triple B bond market has exploded from 686 billion to two and a half trillion, an all time high. In other words, 50% of the investment grade bond market now sits at the lowest rung of the investment grade ladder. Let's stop right there for a second. 50% of the S&P 500 stocks, their bonds are rated just one rung above junk. 50%, folks, is that not a little alerting? Were you surprised by this? Is that not surprising? Yes, it is. And there's a reason this triple B debt is so plentiful. Companies have binged on cheap credit for years. There's always these unforeseen consequences. Ultra low interest rates have seduced companies to pile into the bond market, which who could blame them, right? It's free money, basically. Corporate debt has surged to heights not seen since the global financial crisis. All-time high. Yes, Ted? Is it only businesses, or are there other institutions taking advantage of this? And Everybody's taking advantage of it, particularly the U.S. government, more so than anyone. But this is just has to do with the S&P 500 companies. Yes, ma'am? You know, it's interesting to uh, ask that question, because yes, they are, and I'm going to come right back to that. That's right. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But here is sort of a chart of the bonds that are going to be maturing. Now, remember, these bonds were floated very, very low interest rates. Interest rates are still low, but they're much higher than they were. And these bonds mature. You can see we have $600 billion that matured last year, $700 billion that's going to mature this year, another $750 that's going to mature the year after that. And when these bonds mature, what do you think happens? Huh? <laughs> Not a lot of confidence in those answers. But what happens is they have to refinance them. They have to float another bond. Do they get the same interest rate that they got the first way around? Absolutely not. And let me ask you this. If you were just triple A based on the rates that you had that were all-time low, ultra-low rates, if you were just triple B, you're barely hanging on, and now you got to refinance your bonds at a higher rate, and you were just hanging on at that lower rate, what's going to happen now? Are you still going to be triple B? You'll be lucky if you are, but that's not what Ford, September 9th, last year, downgraded, downgraded to junk status. It's just the first one, I think, of many to come down the pike that's going to happen to not super junky, just kind of like, kind of like you, a little trashy, but not. <laughs> but, but, huh? <laughs> but, but, like sort of a debonair sort of trashiness, you know. Uh, but no, not super junky, but just a little junky. A double B, double B, yeah. So, but you see what I'm getting at here. If you if you had 50% of the S&P companies hanging on for a triple B rating at these super low rates, and now we got 3.2 trillion that's going to be refinanced in the, in the next two or three years, they're not all going to remain at triple B. It's just prima facie. It's going to happen. So, what does that mean for their underlying stock? I have some Voya bond traders that sometimes come. Any Voya bond traders here now? Well, I asked the Voya bond traders. You know what they said? They don't really know, but it's never good. It's never good. Can't be. So, anybody remember this? You see this right here? You, you, this is where you, this is where you, uh, yeah, there's toaster. That's where you uh, tie up your horse, right? 
Now, this is back when banking was, you know, banking. I remember as a kid going with my grandmother to a bank, and she's doing her banking. Grandma would drive, you know, she was born in 1916. She was a child of the Great Depression. So she would drive 20 miles away just to get another quarter point on her CDs, you know, and maybe a toaster. But, um, but I could sit there, and I could always look. I had nothing else to do, so I'm looking around. I'm looking at the bank rates, the CD rates. And you know what was always true? The longer-term CDs always paid more interest than the lower, the shorter-term CDs. Has that ever? Has anybody, you, you follow me? Has it ever been true that a six-month CD paid more than a five-year CD, unless there was a special? No. Well, not until now, right? So take a look at. This is what we call the inverted yield curve. You've heard of it, but I don't know if maybe you knew what that meant. Well, you, the Treasury is kind of like the bank. The United States Treasury is like the biggest bank ever. And they have these three-month CDs, we'll call them, three-month treasuries, and they've got these 10-year treasuries. Now, in the world of normal space and time, it's always true that the longer-term treasuries pay more than the shorter-term treasuries. But in this warped world, now the shorter-term treasury, the three-month, is paying more than the 10-year. That's nonsense. That's crazy. There's reasons for it that I can't go into right now. But if you look at this black line here running horizontally, you see this blue line. Every time the blue line breaks below the black line, that means we have an inverted yield curve. That means the three-month is paying more than the 10-year. Now, what you might not be able to see is this little gray line right here. You see that, barely? Can you see that? No? Trust me, there's a little gray line right there. There's a little gray line right there. There's a little gray line right there. Those little gray lines mean what? Recessions. So follow me here. 1987, inverted yield curve, recession. 1999, 2000, inverted yield curve, recession. Inverted yield curve, recession. Inverted yield curve. Now, how do recessions happen? You have a market crash, right? Stock market crashes first, and then you have, guess what? Higher unemployment. Or those other things. Lagging indicators. Right? By then, it's too late. More crashes already happen. But we have something here that looks like a pretty good leading indicator, do we not? Would we be foolish to ignore this? I believe we would, especially when we've got all these other things that are adding up. Did anybody have a question about this? Because it's pretty significant. Well, have there been times, there have been times, where you had an inverted yield curve not followed by a recession in the next 18 months, haven't there? No. No. Because it doesn't happen that often. Uh, but the reason it does happen is because you have the very short term, on the very short term, you have the Fed funds rate, which is basically the overnight lending rate. That's controlled artificially by the Federal Reserve. The five-year, the 10-year, all those are being uh, basically priced through supply and demand. Now, the Fed manipulates those. They'll buy this one and sell that one and do those kinds of things. But the longer term part of the, uh, of the interest rate curve is basically driven by supply and demand. The very short-term um, rates are not. Those are just man-made up or woman-made up if it's Janet Yellen. So now let's move on to the next anomaly that's out there that's never happened before. Negative interest rates. I mean, it's been a while now that since we've had negative interest rates, so you know it doesn't shock me anymore, I guess, but you know, thinking about negative interest rates and the utility of negative interest rates and the unknown consequences, the unintended consequences of this are starting to show up now. But what's interesting is that of the 15 trillion government bonds worldwide, a quarter of them are now trading at negative rates. So that means that you hand over your money, you give them $10,000, and then maybe in five years, you get like $9,500 back. But your money was safe. And that's what people are buying. That's what they're buying right now. Here's Japan. You can see they're negative by about three basis points, 30 basis points. Germany is negative. 
and Switzerland, who invented it, they're negative. You know? So it's, it's the higher quality countries that have these negative rates because people, not people mostly, institutions, you know, there's $2 trillion a day that's sloshing around the planet. And it's looking for the, it's the, the place that's going to treat it best. And if we're over here paying positive interest, and you've got Germany and Switzerland and Japan all paying negative interest, where, if you're a dollar, where are you going to go? You're going to go to America, right? And that's kind of what's been happening. That's why our dollar has been so strong. That's why it's a great time to go to Great Britain right now. Take your dollars and take a trip because they're strong right now. Is it like a dollar, what, 11 on the euro and what, a dollar 15 on the pound? That's incredible. It's great. Do that. So, inverted yield curve, negative rates, Schiller PE ratio. PE ratio, what is that? Price to earnings. So, the price of the stock basically as a variable or, you know, a function of how much does this company make and how much is the stock valued at? So obviously the more it makes and the lower the price, the better the buy. But this guy, Robert Schiller, who won a Nobel Prize for the Black Schiller housing model. Anybody heard of that? House pricing model? Don't worry about it. It's super technical. But basically it's sort of a forward looking price earnings ratio. And you can see the last time that we were this high, besides the dot-com anomaly, was Black Tuesday back in 1929. So again, would we be stupid? Would we be, you know, would we be imprudent to ignore this? I think if this were the only thing that we had, maybe, but this coupled with everything else, including the inverted yield curve, the manufacturing dropping off, all these other things, it, it raises red flags. Finally, something called the Buffett Indicator. Anybody heard of this? Warren Buffett, you've heard of Warren Buffett, right? So he's had some success over the years. And one of the, thing he, one of the things he looks at is the Wilshire 5000, which is the 5,000 stocks in America, and pretty much all of them that really matter. And then he looks at the gross domestic product and the relationship between these. And again, with the Buffett Indicator, we're at 137. The last time we were that high, again, was back, back in the dot-com era. Look at a little less technical. So we're at 138 today. Back then it was like 137. So again, just one more indicator that we need to stack up on all the others to kind of come up with a forward-looking opinion. Obviously, you know Warren Buffett. Anybody remember back in 1998, they said, oh, Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha has lost it. He's lost it. He's hoarding too much cash. He's got too much cash. He's missing out on all of these fantastic earnings that we're having in Munder Net Net Fund, right? Well, where is Munder Net Net Fund today? Have you even heard of it? No. no? Well, that fund was just the darling of the investment world. You might remember Munder Net Net? Yeah. Did 100% one year, like two years back to back, right? But after 2008, sorry, after 2000, that thing just basically went away. And that's the thing about this, you, you know, it's, people are making money, we've made a lot of money last year, it seems like it's gonna continue this year, but it can't continue forever. And when you see these things stacking up, you have to wonder, I mean, could we be at the tail end of this thing? You know, is it prudent to take some, some money off the table? I think it is prudent. Is it prudent to ignore these things? No, I don't think that's prudent. And so we have a lot of responsibility, and the main responsibility is we gotta protect what you got first. Because most of you, and all of you, you're not going back to work. That's the plan, right? That's the plan. And the plan is that you need to have enough income to live like you want to live and take the cruises that you want to take and buy the mountain cabins that you want to buy and do that till the day you die and have plenty of money to do it and live like you want to. And we have to throw that medical stuff in there because that's expensive, is it not? And it's, a, and it's just a left hook. Okay, so finally... We're down to sort of our last indicator here, which is the repo rate spike. This happened last September. And just to give you a background on this, you have these massive banks, Dutcha Bank, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Bank of Chemical Bank of China, whatever it might be. These guys are trading money all night long. About $2 trillion every day, every 24 hours is traded. 
Now, some of these banks have treasuries or other type of bonds, but mainly in the United States, they're holding U.S. treasuries. Other banks have cash. Sometimes the banks that have the treasuries don't have enough cash, so they have to pledge those treasuries over to another bank that has the cash, right? And the Federal Reserve sets this rate called the Fed Funds Rate. And you can see it's tracked here pretty, pretty much right along to what they set. But back in September, we had a crisis. Overnight, the rate spiked up to 8%, and in some reports, up to 10%. So this is an overnight lending rate between banks. It's supposed to be the lowest rate in the world, and it spiked up that high. The last time that happened was when? Of course, 2008, the financial crisis. You know? The interesting thing about this is there's been several studies, and the Bank of International Settlements came out with a study about a month ago and came up to the conclusion that, hey, guys, what you thought happened is not what happened. And we don't know what happened, but you don't know what happened either. And so really nobody knows what happened. But the things you thought caused it can't be what caused it. There's got to be something else. And I've got my theories, right? But it's a scary thing when this happens. How many of you heard about this on the news? Ted did. Ted, I don't know what station you're listening to. What are you listening to? CNBC or something? or um, Fox Business. Fox Business, okay. So, so, so Ted heard about it at 2 o'clock in the morning when he was watching Fox Business. But most of you did not hear about it, you know, mainly because it's confusing and it's not popular and nobody really understands it. But it's a significant issue. And could this happen again? Yes, it could. The thing about it is, is if the Fed had not stepped in when they did and injected several billion, how many billion are we getting to it now? 80 billion? 1.3 trillion was the original? About 400 billion so far. So we have to keep, keep injecting money into this thing to keep it liquid. If the Fed were to stop, we would probably have a financial crisis. If they had not injected money when they did, there would have been a financial crisis almost certainly. And none of you heard about it, you know, because the average investor is generally the last to find out. The average investor is the last person to learn oh, about this repo rate. But folks, by the time you learn about it, guess what? It's too late. Your account's down 45%. This is why the average investor for the last 20 years has averaged less than 2%. I'm not allowed to say. I honestly, I cannot say. Um, but, I, but if you Google it, you'll, you'll, there'll be some that pop up. And it's always the same kind of dirty fingers. You know what I mean? That's why I think it's somewhat suspicious. It didn't happen naturally, right? There was something else going on. That's right, absolutely. But you see just the average return, you know, 5.62%, that's not exciting, I admit. The bond market, 4.5%, inflation is 2 but really it's more like 8 um, But the average investor, what does the average investor do, you know? They're seeing things are going great right now. Now is when they're jumping in. I have people coming out of the woodwork right now saying, hey, I've got this money. I've had this half a million dollars in the account all these years. I want to get in now. You want to get in now? Where were you five, six, seven years ago? I tried to tell you, you know, it's too late now. Now we need to just hang on, you know. And I guess I can say this. Maybe I'll get sued. I don't know. But what investment company is ever going to tell you, now's not the time to invest, right? It's like, a, it's like a car dealer saying, now's not the time to buy a car. It's not going to happen. You see, you see what I'm saying? you got to have somebody that can help you hold your hand that cares about you first, not about selling investments, right? And that's a big, big difference between just uh, a broker dealer. Okay, so <clears throat> strategic global allocation, that's what we're supposed to say, but it gets better. Over time, you know, these are 10 different asset allocations. Some are, tr some are stocks, some are bonds, but you balance them out, and then over time, they, they, they do okay. Over time, they average about 7%. But there's also something a little bit better than that, which is the tactical asset allocation. Tactical means just what I'm talking about today. We see these leading indicators occurring, 
right? I'm not telling you let's get out and bury our heads in the sand. All I'm saying is let's take some profits off the table and shift them over here to something that's not going to crash. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying get out. I'm just saying let's be smart and not take about take all this risk. It's like Blake used to say, or maybe he still does, is like picking up dimes and quarters in front of a freight train. You don't need to take the additional risk that's occurring right now. And one way you want to have tactical asset allocation, and this is what we're doing now, if you're a client of ours, this is where you are already. If you look at what happened in 2008, the top three things there are stocks. You got the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P. Look how much they were down. A lot, right? Then look what happened the same year to the treasury market. And I can tell you, I lived through this day to day. There was absolutely nothing in this world that was up. Gold, silver, wine, precious jewels, I mean, real estate, fine art, Maseratis, Porsches, Lamborghinis, whatever, everything was down. There was only one thing, one thing only in this entire world that was up, and those were U.S. Treasuries. AAA Georgia municipal bonds were down 35%. AAA, I saw it with my own eyes. Never supposed to happen, but it did. It did happen. And I'm not saying it's going to happen again, but I'm saying it could. And the indicators are all there that, hey, this could be a bumpy ride. I don't know if it's going to be this year or next, but you know what's happening. We had an election year coming up. Remember what happened the last time we had an election? We dropped 19%. Now, I don't know why. I do know why, but I'm not going to say that I know why. But, but you know, there, there are these indicators that are concerning. Finally, like said this, it's like we're kind of like doctors, you know, in a way. Who likes to go see their doctor? Who enjoys that? I can tell you, I, you do, Doug, because you are one, and you probably know them all. You probably <laughs> train them. And you've probably got some beautiful young doctor girls that you're going to see. I know you. <laughs> so besides Doug, no one likes to go see their doctors. And because you know why? They're going to tell you things you don't want to hear. You got to you got to eat less fat. You got to exercise more. You got to quit doing that. You got to you know, uh, and, and we're kind of like that. You know, we tell you things maybe you don't want to hear, but you're better off for it. You're better off for it. Any questions, anybody? Now look around you. A lot of people will have stars on your name tag. If you have a star, I'm not worried about you because that means you're a client. If you don't have a star, you might want to think about looking at ways of getting a star. And it's real easy. All you got to do is just sign up a time to meet with me. We'll take about 20, 30 minutes, and we'll talk about if there's anything we can do to help. That's, that's it. It's not about money as much as it is how much we like you. So if you have a good personality or a likable person, you have a lot of friends, come on in. But you know it. If you're a grumpy person, just stay home. Just stay home. I love you, but it's not worth it. So everybody take some time to read these definitions. Index definitions, very exciting. We'll have this online later. Um, and then finally, not like Merv Griffin, we hope to see you at the next Lunch and Learn. Everybody enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>